Okay, so now we move on to our last speaker, Henry Lusengau. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. <laughs> uh, for the past six years, Henry has worked for the UK Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, also known as DEFRA, leading reform of the water abstraction regime. But prior to joining DEFRA, he worked for consultancy, GHK, as a principal specialising in environmental economic policy. And before then, he worked as an economic analyst and a manager at the Environment Agency, supporting policies on water, waste and regulation. And prior to that, worked for seven years in the Australian Commonwealth Government, mainly developing policy on trade and environment. Uh, he's also a chartered accountant with a master's degree in environmental management and development and an honours degree in philosophy. A particular interest in cutting-edge economic thinking, uh, such as behavioural and evolutionary economics and agent-based modelling. And Henry is going to give his speech without slides today. Without <laughs> <laughs> notes, either. Really? Uh, so we'll see how it goes. It's an experiment. Uh, good evening. And uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for having me here. I'm not a hydrologist. I'm not a member of SIWEM. So you may well know much more about this than, uh, than I do at all. So we'll see how we go. Uh, first, I'm interested... Uh, how many people have read the uh, government consultation response on abstraction reform? Ooh, not very good. Well, I hope that the results of this talk might... One, I, I, I then have a clear objective for this talk, is to um, interest you enough so you read it. Uh, it's on the DEFRA website. Um, it's not that long. It's uh, <laughs> only about 55... <coughs> Pages and some people have said it's quite a racy read <laughs> as these things go. <laughs> um, so, I'm going to tell uh, a couple of stories and then uh, relate those stories to um, abstraction reform, what we're trying to do, um, with the hope that that will fire your imagination to uh, uh, go forth and uh, read a bureaucratic uh, publication. Um, so, the first story. Um, it's about Spain. Uh, now, who here knows about uh, the sort of water management abstraction in Spain? Oh, great, no one knows about it, so I can make that one up. Good, I was sort of worried for a moment because uh, I don't know much about abstraction in Spain either. But I did um, see what I thought was a very fascinating gripping talk at the UK Irrigation Association on, uh, on Spain, and particularly the area of uh, Valencia. Um, the guy who presented was a, uh, a Spanish uh, academic uh, who had about 500 slides uh, and he broke every single rule of, uh, of presentation. He rushed through them and picked out data and things, but he actually gripped everyone. And um, he told the story of uh, Valencia and the, um, the management of water there. And the thing that sort of struck me was the way Farmers were involved with the regulator. They were working together to uh, work out what water was needed. They had quite sophisticated models, uh, but it seemed to be sort of uh, a prime example of collaborative uh, water management. Um, and um, so I thought, you know, I wonder how the Spanish weather situation, climate, sort of compares to us under climate change. And luckily, there was. Someone there at the conference, uh, Tim Benton, who people might have seen is uh, University of Leeds guy on food security, has a sort of fascinating story about the fact that we're all going to starve at one point uh, down the track, but apart from that, he's a very cheery, cheery guy. Um, but he said that, that in 100 years' time, um, our climate has a reasonable chance, and I'm sure people here will know better about this, uh, of, of being similar to Spain. Uh, so we've got about 100 years uh, to develop the sort of catchment management uh, uh, sort of expertise and institutions that they have. But then the guy said, well, it took them 1,000 years to get there. Because uh, actually a lot of the structure, a lot of the water management goes back in Spain to Arab times, to Roman times, and so forth. Um, so that suggests a bit of a rush. Uh, so what's that got to do with abstraction reform? Well, one of the major elements of abstraction reform is taking a system that is being traditionally, historically, one which is very individual, very isolated, bitty. Um, people have licenses. On each license, you have all your conditions, uh, you have your volumes, and so forth. Now, obviously, there's catchment 
uh, a strategy, management strategies that sort of try and pull it together. But compared to a lot of other work on catchment management, uh, it's very difficult to get a hold of, to get a sort of picture. Uh, one of the major things that we've done in reforming the system, or what we're planning to do, is create something called catchment rules. And catchment rules are a bit like a sort of manual as to how to run a catchment. They take conditions that are currently on licenses and put them in a sort of general rule book that everyone with their licenses, which are going to be called permits, have to follow. So, for instance, um, hands off flows, which tend to be set on levels uh, uh, in, in a catchment at certain points. Uh, and each, cap, each license has its own hands off flow, its own level, and so forth. What we're going to do is create uh, a, 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 a set of sort of different levels of reliability of licenses. So you have a permit that's um, level reliability zero, which means it's very reliable, or two, or three, or four. And on your permit, all it will say effectively is your reliability one or reliability three, or six. But then in the catchment rules, it'll translate those reliabilities into flows. So it'll say that reliability one shuts off when the flow is such and such a level at such and such a gauging station. So that's in the rule. And that means that when you're, on the basis of this wonderful hydroecological data, uh, reckoning that uh, things are going a bit pear-shaped in the catchment, well, you can change all the levels on all the licenses in the particular rivers in the particular catchment at once in the catchment rules in terms of when they trigger, uh, when they cut people off. You also have in the catchment rules uh, rules about low flows management. So you might have heard of Section 57, which is on irrigator licenses, which means that they have to be cut off uh, uh, when there's a drought or, or pressures on the environment. Well, what we're moving to is a set of generic rules to cover everyone, which says that these abstractions are particularly significant for the catchment, therefore they cut off earlier. We have particular levels of flows, which says, you know, we've put out a message to everyone, they've got to be more water efficient, we up the monitoring, and so forth. So we have a sort of rules on catchment management. We have rules on pre-approved trading. Um, we have rules on uh, the, the, the target flows for that catchment. Uh, we have information about the risks in that catchment, the state of the catchment, and so forth. So we have a document that has everything about how that catchment runs from an abstraction viewpoint. And why does that matter? Well, our Secretary of State and generally DEFRA are big into catchment management. And uh, the 25-year environment plan, which has been developed, that's one of the key themes, natural capital management, managing natural capital, uh, local environment decision-making, and so on. And obviously, water quality have had a tradition of catchment management. Uh, with the flooding, there's a renewed interest in natural flood risk management. Uh, there's an increasing interest in hydromorphology, river restoration, and so on. So you're beginning to get a range of issues which cut across all the different uh, areas of the catchment. And an interest in people engaging with that and becoming more responsible at a, at a local level for managing their catchment. And in abstraction reform, we've come, created the tools that allow that to happen. So we can get to a place that Spain got to in a thousand years and probably a lot quicker. Uh, and once we've got this brilliant data, and we get better data, we can then manage to uh, uh, the sort of flows we need uh, based on evidence for the actual catchment. So one key theme is catchment management and bringing abstraction regulation out of cold, if you like, into the catchment management fold. So my second story brings us a little bit closer to home and uh, to Kent which is a very nice place. Um, and they grow a lot of fruit uh, and vegetables uh, using trickle irrigation. Um, now, their use of water over the last five years uh, has doubled. And it's doubled partly because they've had 
incredible uh, economic growth. Uh, the fruit and salad sector in Kent, since uh, in Southeast, since 2000, has grown by 156% in terms of economic value. I believe that uh, a lot of supermarkets have moved to local sourcing, but they've not just grown economically, uh, they've grown in water intensity. So uh, they used to grow things in the ground with earth, uh, and that needs less water. Uh, but they found that if you put them on tabletops and raise them up, uh, the costs of picking, labour costs, are much lower. At the moment, trickle irrigators don't have to be licensed. And very, that goes back to the fact that when the legislation in 1991 uh, was written, um, trickle irrigation wasn't well known. Um, apparently existed, I'm told. But at least the legislators didn't know it existed. So when they wrote the legislation uh, and described irrigation, they didn't cover trickle irrigation. So trickle irrigation has been exempt from regulation. So these growers in Kent and actually other places like West, West Sussex, which I'll come to, have been growing in their water use hugely without any control at all uh, for the last, whatever, 20 odd years. Mm. But we're going to change that. They've had far too easy a time. And uh, in the interests of equity and treating everyone the same and trying to control the buggers because they're doing what they like, we're going to bring them into the licensing uh, system. Actually, this goes back to legislation in 2003, uh, which uh, we've taken rather a long time to implement. We actually had a uh, consultation in 2009, and we just responded to it in 2015. But it is going to happen now, and um, they're going to um, have to tell us how much they've been using water over the period of 2012 to 2016. And we're going to give them a license, this is what we're proposing at the moment, to, uh, though we're out, out of consultation, based on how much they use, the maximum amount they use, between 2012 and 2016. However, they have to wait a bit to get the license. They have to wait till 2021, maybe they might get it a bit earlier. So by 2021, if they're on the same growth trajectory and they've increased their water intensity, they're going to need a lot more water. And they're going to get a license, which is not nearly as much as they need. Um, and some of them have been put in water harvesting, uh, uh, and actually on big greenhouses, you can capture quite a lot of water and put it in uh, reservoirs. Uh, but ultimately, they are going to need more water, and they are largely in catchments without any extra water. So what is the solution? They're not a very happy bunch, or they haven't been in the past. But in another part of the woods, uh, Southern Water, in their water resource management plan, uh, have a, an option to put in a reuse uh, scheme at the bottom of the Medway, um, which is quite decent size, uh, designed to be put in about 2022. So 2022, they're going to have a license in 2021, some distance. So you have a lot more water. <coughs> Unfortunately, the growers don't grow near the Medway reuse scheme. So there's no extra water suddenly for the, uh, for the growers. But, of course, because Southern Water have a system that's all linked up, or to some extent linked up in the Medway, if there's more water at the bottom of the Medway than the water reuse scheme, Suddenly, they don't need to keep all the water in the fuel reservoir, which is at the top of the medway, and maybe some of their groundwater licenses, they can release water on the, from those. So suddenly, there's extra water flowing around Kent, which potentially could go to the growers. So what's that got to do with abstraction reform? Well, one of the key elements of abstraction reform is facilitating trading pre-approving a set of trades that can happen sort of instantaneously. So suddenly you've got a mechanism to the deliver the extra water that's coming from the reuse scheme down at the bottom of the medway to these abstractors, these growers, and they desperately need it. 
And according to Southern, uh, when they implement the reuse scheme, it's got 20 megalitres, something like that, per day. I'm not very good at units. Um, and the total irrigation requirement in Kent is 10% of that. And that reuse scheme is designed to meet demand 20 years down the track, because you plan ahead, you invest early, so you've got, they've got lots of extra water for about 10 or 15 years. But then you may ask, what happens when they run out of that water? Because they finance that reuse scheme based on off what financing for the public water sector, they've got some extra water, they sell it, off what agree that they can keep some of the money, some of the money goes back to customers, all clear. But then, in about 10 years, 15 years time, they run out of water. And of course, if I'm a grower with a major investment in huge greenhouse systems and so forth, the fact that 10 or 15 years down the track, there won't be any water is a problem. However, they've got a wonderful water resource management planning system and they just bring forward the next option. And it happens to be the case that the reuse scheme is modular. And so they build another pipe to do the reuse scheme at the bottom of the medway. And at that point, they actually have to put the bit of pipe that's going to keep the supply to the growers outside the off what regulatory system. I hope you understand the off what regulatory system, but it is designed to supply the public water system. And if you're doing something for a business outside, you can't use the same mechanisms for off what as you can inside the system. So it's separately, it's called non-regulated. <coughs> but because they've got a record of revenue of selling the water previously to the growers, they've got a business case for an investor to come in and invest in the extra capacity to keep the water flowing to the growers. So by creating a very sophisticated system to underpin the delivery of water through natural systems through trading, we can ensure, we can sort of link up the water resource management, management process, the assets that companies invest in, with people outside the management system. And that is needed in 2021 or 2022 when, you know, instantaneously when the abstraction reform system happens. And that requires a lot more sophisticated systems uh, and ways of controlling put and take trades so that uh, um, Southern can drop water in from fuel reservoir down the medway and someone else can take it out with anyone, without anyone taking it out in between. So abstraction reform becomes a delivery mechanism for contracts, financial contracts over the long term that water companies have with the likes of these growers. And West Sussex, the next one where we're going to go and try and work it out, have much bigger growers uh, with much bigger businesses who also have the same problem. So we have potentially a set of people who want to be regulated, who are willing to be paid to be regulated, because actually regulation provides a facility to help them get water. And that changes the whole sort of basis of what we mean by regulation and what regulation does. So regulation is no longer something, an evil, that uh, you want to avoid and try and minimize as much as possible. Regulation actually becomes a service, a benefit, to ensure you can get water when you need it. You can manage your risks over the future. And fundamentally, abstraction reform is about providing a framework to help businesses manage their risks from climate change, from lack of water in the future, while protecting the environment, driven by the sort of evidence uh, that Andy has provided. I'm finished. Perfect. <laughs> so that's my story. So I hope, as a result of this, you will go and read the abstraction reform <laughs> response, because it sets out a whole radical change in how we understand uh, the regulation of abstraction and sets us on a whole different course to a future where we can cope with climate change. Does anyone have any questions for Henry specifically at this point? Um, I have a question. Um, so down the line, and it doesn't work, and, and, and the ECI for or, or the abstraction for that catchment reduces, say for example, um, and then 
some more water is required for the public supply. And they would some of them then buy back some license back from the growers, or, or uh, do we all end up as, as, as people who pay water bills as buying back stuff uh, that um, a private company has made a profit on selling to, <laughs> to another private company? Well, I suppose the sales might be temporary because mm. the contract with the growers will be <coughs> to supply water when they need it. How that will work, um, I suppose, is a different matter, but I suppose it will have to be delivered by temporary license trade uh, because it could well be that the, the water from Southern is uh, on top of what they have already and they may need it sometimes when they can't get water elsewhere. There'll be different range of contracts. Some contracts might be for continuous supply. Some contracts might be what you might call resilient services. Um, if um, Andy comes along and says, "Hey, up, lads," <laughs> I wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> that river looks a bit sick. We've got to take water sick. away. <laughs> then there'll be a process of reducing licenses across the piece. Or actually, it could be changing the catchment rules so that the ability to access uh, water changes. Um, the water company will then have to reassess its capacity and assets and, and its ability to continue to supply. But it will, it will actually trigger it to invest more. So, um, and the Environment Agency has a duty not to undermine the, the public water supply situation. So what will happen is there will be time involved and that will trigger more investment. So the contracts will stick with the, um, with the growers and people like that. Um, the levels of service to uh, the public uh, will stay the same. It's just that there will be a triggered uh, investment in, in further water resources. Can I open the floor up to questions for all the speakers now? Um, thank you. Uh, Emma. Um, I just have a question for you, actually. Um, in terms of actual rules, if they are subject to change, is there going to be a period over which they can change? For example, well, every five years, because at the minute the license is applied and then current limits start. But presumably, we'll be talking about the new, uh, certain amount of certainty in how much water they're going to have at any point in time. Is you know, it's a dry year? Oh, stop picking it up. Um, I mean, this is the key challenge with catchment management in terms of being able to provide a level of certainty, but then having a level of flexibility to protect the environment. And how you balance those two is one of the, 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 the key issues. Um, what we indicated is that the, there'd be a process of catchment reviews. So um, there'd be monitoring of the, the state of the environment, there'd be data on that, uh, that this would be communicated to abstractors in the catchment. So abstractors would know how much risk there was in terms of their permits being changed, and their permits include the catchment rules. So catchment rules are effectively conditions on their permit, and the permits are reviewable. But there'll be, review, there'll be rules about the fact, well, A, there'd have to be regular information updates, so you have a sense of the level of risk to your permits. Then, if the uh, environmental data suggested that you know, uh, there was a need to change those, then a review would be triggered. So you go from broad information that you'll get it, things were a bit tricky or not tricky at all to a, a sort of there is a review triggered. Then the review would uh, there'd be an investigation um, to both investigate you know, were these indicators valid or something else going on, was it an abstraction issue? Uh, then the, the investigation would consider what needed to be done in terms of changes to the catchment rules. Um, there'll be a conclusion as to what changes were required, which, because you're managing the catchment sort of as a whole, would probably involve relatively small changes to lots of people. So it would be less maybe about particular people affecting particular triple SI sites, for instance, as the RSA program in the past has been, and more about a lot of people having a certain amount of change in terms of rebalancing uh, the catchment. And 
once that was decided, those would effectively be measures under the Water Framework Directive, and basically you have to implement measures under the Water Framework, Water Framework Directive within three years. So there'd be a further sort of notice period before they actually hit, you know, uh, uh, were actually implemented. But that would also be factored around, you know, the, the environment agency's duties not to disrupt the, um, the public water supply as well. So uh, a lot of this is about um, providing data on risk and to, for people to respond and plan for it. And actually it's interesting that um, farmers in East Anglia are, are doing lots of work on how they can understand risk for their availability of water, for instance, which obviously the water companies understand a lot more than they could be better. Uh, but, um, you know, so people can react and respond. Thanks, Andrew. Are there any other questions? Um, are there any mechanisms for transferring water from, uh, for example, Northumbria's water, or do you have a huge excess of, uh, to the southern water companies? Well, abstraction management itself um, is not really a mechanism as such, though it would. Um, I suppose particular catchments, you would see the, because of the trading activity and actually we're going to require reporting prices and so forth, you would see that water was getting very expensive in particular places, which might encourage people to invest in transfer schemes. Um, there is also uh, work that I'm involved in on uh, reform of upstream competition, which could have a, a water trading and so on. But uh, transfers probably are likely to be uh, deals between water companies uh, and investments in infrastructure as part of the water resource management plan process. Uh, but they obviously could be a resource to allow, to free up other resources to facilitate trading of available water to other people. So they, um, they can be part of the story. I mean, obviously, abstraction reform is only one part of a very complex picture in terms of aquat reform, in terms of the sort of water resource management planning that's happening with the UK water company project, looking at resilience and, and so forth. So there's a lot else going on. Uh, although abstraction reform, I believe, is very important, it is not quite the answer to the world of the universe and everything. Thanks. Andy, would you like to speak? I mean, yeah, just picking up on your point about uh, these, these reviews. Um, you might <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, I mean, I think it's... In it's good to know that if you know if the, these catchment lot, catchment kind of uh, documents about around permitting are not quite right, they'll be reviewed, take, take, um, taking place to understand how it could be changed. But um, how long are these reviews going to take? But we we thought long and hard about how long because by giving sort of fixed periods, you give a level of certainty but you reduce the ability to change. Um, and the Water Framework Directive gives certain constraints on what you can give if you need to be noticed. And we also thought that the length of the review is to some extent relative to the, the need to investigate. Uh, you know, how much information do you have? Um, how much work do you need to do? So in the end, we went for more of a sort of um, wheel keep you informed of the status so that you, if, if a review is called, it's not as if you didn't sort of know it was going to happen because you knew things were pretty dicey. Um, and we then give an idea of, well, given the issues, this is a sort of three-year investigation or a six-year investigation, you know, sort of, mm. um, and, and then you get three years notice. So um, it will be sort of interesting um, in terms of the when the law goes through and stuff, what sort of feedback we get on that and whether there's a move to try and force us to put more mm. sort of specific data. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, I think that's quite a long time to review. Um, so, because I've never been entirely convinced with the, uh, the baseline data set used as part of the extraction reform process. Um, and a good example... What's that? What, what do you mean by um, the um, well the, the, the period of data the rainfall data the flows the abstraction and the period looked at as part of that abstraction reform that we use for modeling that's right yeah oh. and and just to give an example so 
Um, so for these uh, irrigation licenses, so I mean, so 2012 to 2016 is going to be used as the ah, that's the, the new authorizations. Um, yeah, that's just an example. Yeah. Um, but that that's not been a particularly uh, dry period. Yeah. Um, and so it's actually been pretty wet. Um, and so if we're basing um, these new licenses on that period, actually the the, uh, the spray, irrigate, spray irrigation people with the greenhouses, they would have actually got a lot from rainwater harvesting. Um, so if they say, well, we only need this additional water in that period of time, in a drought situation, there'll be less rainfall, they might need a lot, lot more water. And so that baseline might not be, might not be quite correct for a, a drought situation. Uh, h- hence, while I, was, while I was asking about the review process, because um, it takes, it takes you know, three years for a review to go through and for a change to be implemented in the catchment. Um, the, you know, these irrigators, you know, they 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 you know, they they're driven by market forces, which can change from you know season to season. So, and I'm, I'm not sure that'd be quick enough um, to to help help these uh, these irrigators. Interesting. Well, on the first point of the four years uh, for removal of exemptions, uh, I think the thinking was there that um, people who are currently exempt uh, from the licensing regime, have no actual legal requirement to uh, monitor their abstractions. Um, and so it's not like people in the system where you have a record of, uh, of abstraction um, patterns. And also, there was a thought that if you don't use your license for four years, uh, you can get it taken away from you without paying compensation. So that was, the four years were sort of came from that, whether, you know, where we end on that, I know that's one of the issues that um, abstractors are, are raising. Uh, in terms of reviews, um, I thought we were giving more time for people to respond or, or be prepared, if you like. I don't know, you know, sort of interesting question, isn't it? Um, you know, if things look a bit dicey, you know, do you want to wait around to, for, for bit to find out what the answer is, or do you want to hear the worst now? Yeah. Um, and I suppose, to some extent, that's why you know we haven't sort of defined the time. Um, there's a question of how long it would take to determine if there was a problem and what the, what the solution was, uh, and maybe you could sort of indicate that and do it as quickly as possible, uh, so people are put out of their misery, if you like. Mm. I mean, you know, I mean, if it took three years, you know, that some of these businesses would, 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 would go, wouldn't they? Um, they have to wait around three years. If they need more water, um, because they, because the, the volume they've got now isn't quite right, they, they will go out of business um, if it took that long to get, to change, to change their license. So maybe... Oh, wait a moment. Sorry. Just, maybe this is a discussion we can... We can talk about it in more detail later. Yeah, in yeah, more, yeah. more detail later, because I'm yeah. mindful of time, and I'd just like to offer the opportunity for one more question from the uh, audience. To any of our speakers before we close the event, and you have your hand up. Oh, if, if I may have a, 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 a quick question for you, Henry. Yeah. In context of Lord and Andy's presentation and the southeast of England, would you consider it more likely that the bill is going to go down, stay flat, or the increase? In the we have a model <laughs> <laughs> to uh, determine that. Uh, which I haven't had a huge amount to do with, uh, I must say. Um, and um, the question of the drivers of water company bills is quite a, a complex thing. Um, and as far as I understand it, um, when you look at um, where water company costs come from, the, the water resources side um, is actually relatively small in, in, in terms of their sort of overall cost base. Uh, and actually, the, a, a lot of their cost base is the network, and I don't know much about the network. But I seem to remember with the, the sort of modelling that was done um, on uh, uh, water bills, they sort of had the sort of classic, um, well, it doesn't look so bad, but a lot of things could change and make it a lot worse sort of thing. Um, because there were lots of sort of unknowns, but on the face of it, it wasn't looking too bad. There was a lot of uncertainties, uh, I think, you know, around things like abstraction reductions um, and various things. So it wasn't, you know, instinctively you think with climate change and uh, the fact that we've been sort of, water companies have been effectively sweating their assets for some period without actually investing. Um, you might, you know, instinctively you think the prices are going to go up when you on the, on, with the push to resilience as well, there seems to be 
a lot of push to make some investments, but obviously in the current economic climate, there will also be lots of pressure to keep prices down. So how that plays out um, will be a very interesting to see. Watch this space. Watch this space. Watch this space indeed. Thank you very much. And please can you uh, give your thanks to all of our speakers, to Henry, to Andy, and to Luce.